Father, right now, Lord, we ask you, Lord, to just dispatch your angels into the four corners of this sanctuary, Lord, and loose your power. Meet every need here on this day. We welcome healing, deliverance, and miracles in this place. Oh, Father, we ask you to have this your way. Father, right now, Lord, we ask you to take this worship experience in the palm of your hand. Oh, we, uh, you are the part and we are the clay. Moses, shape of them to worship on this morning. This is my prayer. In Jesus' name I pray.
I, I don't know about you, but maybe I'm the only one that has that walked around throughout the day with a heavy burden on my shoulder and, 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 and I just kept saying, I don't care what it looks like, I don't, I don't care what it feels like, I just know the Lord's going to make a way. Abundantly, 
And because he gave up his life, we have that privilege this morning. Nothing that we earn, but it's because of the sacrifice. Father, this morning, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for allowing us to see another day. A day we were not guaranteed. A day we've never seen before. And a day we will never see again. But Lord, because we have the privilege, we're going to walk out around this day, God, and say thank you. Thank you for what you have done for us in the past. Thank you for where you brought us to right now. And we thank you for where you're going to take us to in the future. Lord, forgive us for our sins. For we realize that we're filthy rags. Not deserving of anything, God. But because of your grace and mercy. And because of the privilege, God. We stand before you. Clean us up, God, as only you can. Fill us up where we're weak and where we're torn down. For, Lord, the weight of the world is heavy on our shoulders. Lord, we thank you, God, because we know you are the great burden bearer. And, Lord, there's nothing that we're going through. No burden, no storm, no sickness, no sadness that, Lord, you cannot help us through. Oh, Lord, help us to stand. Help us to be bold, God. Help us to walk in faith. Not in our own might, God, but Lord, help us just to stand and depend on you, God. And Lord, when we get the big chest, Lord, help us to remember it's not us, but it's all about you. And we thank you for what you have done. We pray that you will take this service in your hand. Please, Lord. Lord, let it not be done, anything done in self. But Lord, let everything be done for the glory of you. That when people ride by the campus, they're about kingdom business. When people walk in our doors, they'll say, they're about kingdom business. When they hear us talk, when they hear us pray, they'll say, they're about kingdom business. Lord, help us to be humble. Walk in your will and walk in your way, God. We pray for every auxiliary in this church, from the wall to wall, from pew to pew, that you will touch every member, God. Lord, somebody came here this morning, Lord, on faith. They came empty in their hearts, but they came here on faith. Don't let them go back the same. And Lord, our pastor, may you touch him, God, as only you can. Lord, touch him as only you can. Touch him as only you can. Touch him as only you can, God. That you will give him the strength. That you will give him the wisdom. That you will give him the knowledge. That you will give him a revelation, God. Touch him as only you can, God. Lord, his family, this church, everyone who is connected to this ministry, everyone who is watching us virtually, everyone who is in our conference, everyone who is in our neighborhood, Lord, that you would just touch every God. And Lord, when we leave here, God, don't let us leave here empty. Let us leave here filled, God. And Lord, when we drive home in our streets of our neighborhood, May the world feel your presence and know there's a change, a change that has come about, God. And we thank you for every sick member, every shut-in, God, everyone who's got a prayer request, and that's all of us. Remember us, God. And Lord, after you've done all of these things, God, I pray that you'll save a special blessing for me. Remember me in my home. Remember us at Bellingham Way. And we thank you, God, that it's already done. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Blessed Holy Ghost, and all of God's believers who believe, say amen, amen, amen.
trouble don't arrive. I'm going to hasten to his throne. Put me in the pool. But 
why I'm coming another step down before me. This morning I would like to use as a spiritual guide to preach. This thought, you will never be blessed making excuses. You will never be blessed making excuses. I want to make this disclaimer because of various mindsets in the house of God. The topic used today as a spiritual guide is not to be thought of as singling any person in the setting today, but Christian folks in general. I believe you agree with me in saying that some of us, and I did say some of us, to indicate I'm no exception, that we are not careful. The adversary will cause us to lose our blessing if we don't keep our eye on the mark, which is Jesus the Christ. After all, Jesus did say the thief come not but to steal, to kill, and destroy. Did he not? As kingdom building, we make too many excuses to why we can't complete our assignment. Now, if you're not a Christian, it is my desire that you accept him today. But to those of us that have put our hand to the gospel plow, it's time out for making excuses if you want to be blessed of God. To have a reason for not completing your assignment and to make an excuse for not completing your assignment is like your faith is unfaithfulness keeping you falsely true. Now, Webster explanation says reason implies that fault is sincerely recognized and accepted that you step up and take accountability of your action. An excuse exists to justify, blame, or defend a fault with the intent to absolve oneself of, its, of accountability. Now I'm sure we all have been there when we didn't want to do something that caused us to come out of our comfort zone. Yes. Now am I right about it? Yes. So today I want to eisegese, not exegese this text because I want to point a different aspect of this story concerning the man at the pool they call Bethesda. To give you a brief synopsis, this pool was in Jerusalem where Jesus had healed a man that had been sick for 38 years. The name means house of mercy. Most ancient manuscripts identify Bethesda as the place of the pool. The water of the pool 
were popular beliefs to possess and create power because the man who was healed after 38 years experienced an outpour of God's mercy on the Sabbath. How many of you know that God is still pouring out his power today? The reference to the pool being stirred by angels in the last part of the third verse and the first part of the fourth is not found in either the older or the majority of the manuscript. However, regardless of the disagreements between the manuscript on the name of the pool or the angel's passage, the pool did exist. God is healing his God divine work through instruments and ways he chooses to bring help to persons sick physically, emotionally, and spiritually. The Bible not only tells of people's spiritual status, but is also concerned about their physical condition. Christians are awfully confused about the ministry of healing, but these biblical teachings clearly appear in our holy writ. First, the Bible clearly states that James, that Jesus believe in healing of the body. Secondly, Jesus spoke of doctors in a positive way as he compared those in good health who have no need of a physician with those who, who do need his help. And we found that in Matthew 9 and 12 and Mark and 2 and 17 which said, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. God has often healed by the way he was led, indicated science unto the discovery of our body function. Dr. Joseph uh, Taylor, Nobel, Nobel Prize winner, made this quote. A scientific discovery is also a religious discovery. There is no conflict between science and religion. Our knowledge of God is made larger with every discovery we make about the world. Thirdly, the method of healing Jesus used include prayer, laying on a hand, anointing with all, and assurance of forgiveness of sin. And we find in the church, uh, we find that these methods continue in the church because James 5 and 14 and 16 says, if there be any sick among you, let them call the elders of the church and let them pray over them and anoint them with all. Finally, Jesus did not use healing as a means of gaining attention, but tried to keep the experience private. We have pastor, teachers, apostles, prophets that use these methods mean that mentioned as a means of making profit. Now, Ecclesiastes three and one. The preacher tells us that to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under the heaven. Look at someone and tell them timing is important. The secret to having peace with God is to discover itself and appreciate God's perfect timing. There's a danger in doubting and resenting God's timing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This can lead to despair, rebellion, and cause you to move ahead out of God's guidance. Yes. We don't have any problem at reading the almanacs uh, when planting uh, seeds 
for a natural harvest. But we make all these excuses when it comes to using God's plan. Yes. Yes. Jeremiah 29, 4 through 14, it says God it has a perfect, a perfect and a plan for you. His plans are sure, true, and faithful. God's plan for you is to prosper, to grow spiritually in Christ. In every situation you are in right now. Uh, Proverbs 22 and 13, it reads, The lazy person claims there's a lion out there. If I go out, I might be killed. What this proverb referred to is excuse of a lazy person who make, who say that he don't want to go out just to avoid work. The excuse sounds silly to us, but that also is how our excuses sound to others when we try to rationalize our excuse instead of taking responsibility that and go head on and go about our father's business. Now I'm going somewhere with this. As we look at our lesson text today, we find a need for mercy because people with various diseases and disability populated the porch around the pool. Blind, lame, paralyzed, and diseased they were all occupying the porch. These people are representatives of a mother too, of spiritual sick people of the world today. Without Christ, we are helpless and violent to a cruel and unfair world. Let's face it, life isn't fair. It throws hard things at every one of us and some of the things that he throws at us we wouldn't even wish it on nobody else. I'm sure some of us can manage difficult situations at times but there are others who have a problem at hand. No one is immune to pain and the cruelty of this world. It is important to be aware that hurting people are constantly around us. And the hurting people, they need love too. So many times we turn our back on those that need us. We make all kinds of excuses not to help others out. Well, the compassion of Jesus was thrown to hurting people, even like, even like in the scripture, the adulterous woman, a questioning Pharisee, a light in the demons, a rough neck Peter, full of fishermen. God continue to call and reach out to the wounded of our world. We find that Jesus also mercy to anyone and anyone that need help. He asks what we consider a rhetorical question. But a very reasonable question, he asked him, do you want to get well? Well, I stopped by to let you know if Jesus was the whisper in your ear and asked you, do you want to get well? You will look at him and say, oh, I want to get out. 
a reason for not receiving me. Yeah. It's here in verse 7 when he said, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in the pool. Yeah. He didn't even answer Jesus' question. It's about like, why didn't you go to church today? I didn't have a ride to catch. James 4 and 2 says that we have not because we ask not. I don't think I'm going too far to say that sometimes we have not because we answer not. Jesus patiently listened to the man's sad story. Then said, rise up, take your bed and walk. How many times have you asked somebody, how are you doing? And you get a sad story. To the point that you kind of wish you wouldn't even ask. But you ask because you're concerned. And we are to be concerned. But sometimes, that's what happened. Of all these years, what wonderful words to hear. Jesus did not even acknowledge the man's failure to answer his question. In a sense, Jesus speaks those same words of mercy to us at some point in our lives. Rise from your place of failure, inability, despair. Rise from that place of hope. Rise up from that slackness. Rise up from that doubt. There are Four seasons in a year. Work with it. Spring, summer, fall, and winter. They follow one another regularly. Am I right? Each has its own light temperature and weather pattern that repeats yearly. I stop by today to encourage your heart by letting you know that there is a spiritual realm that is a fifth season for your life. But you will never be blessed making excuses when your time come. Right now, it's your season. You need to know when your season is before you. And stop giving other folks your space. Stop letting people dictate your healing. Stop letting people Dictate your breakthrough. You stop letting people get before you. Do you want to be healed? Then you have to act like you want to be healed. Show God some sign. He showed you your season. Now all you need to do is just plant in that season and watch your harvest come forth. Maybe you have contemplated when God is going to come for
fulfill that promise that you've been waiting for all your life? Can I declare and decree today that your testimony is now? It is the right time for you to be blessed, but you got to stop making excuses. We come to church and the pool is troubled. And the Spirit of God tells you to get up. I'm ready to bless you. But something tells you to sit right there. I don't know about you, but if I'm hurting, if I have to rock a person in front of me in a pew, I'm going to grab hold of the back of that pew and I'm going to pull up and I'm going to stand up. I'm going to receive my blessing. This man had been there for 38 years. I don't think you can record this record. He didn't know how he would get out of this disability, so he just stayed there. Maybe he had been using the same excuse year after year after year. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I, have, I have made a lot of excuses in my life. I'll be the first to say it. I have made excuses that have cost me. But I made my mind up that I will not make an excuse when it come to working in God's kingdom. You might not know how to get out of your limitation, your burden, your sickness, your debt, your sorrow, your loneliness. But I got good news for you. It's, it's, it's your season now. It's your time. Jesus bypassed a lot of people that day just to get to that man that day. And when you arrived this morning, Jesus was already here waiting for you. A Bible 2 and 3 said, if you want to be receive your deliverance, he said, wait for it. When I come to church, you come to church, when the time is right, you wait for it. You look, say, now this is the time. I don't care if I'm preaching and it's that singing. If your time comes and you know it's your time for you to get up and come up to this altar or to walk out, you need to go out and walk out and show God that you're worthy, that you want what he has for you. One would wonder if this man actually made the same excuse the other year. Jacob, he knew his time to come, so he refused to turn the angel loose. The lady that had the issue of love for 12 long years, she knew her time had come, so she, she, she told him to slide and they would get out of the way. It, it's, it's my time. She sees her opportunity. I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but I have just ministered to someone whose time has come. But you got to stop letting people keep you from your blessing. Are you ready now? Because your time has come. Look at your neighbor or the one next to you and say, I'm tired 
I'm sick and tired of losing out on my blessing because of an excuse. Come to your feet. Yeah. 